Good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you for joining Grand Rounds. I'm Rich Zane. I'm the chair of the Department of Emergency Medicine. Um, I want to thank everybody for coming, uh, and I'm thrilled that we are restarting uh, Grand Rounds uh, in this virtual format. Um, I also am thrilled to welcome our intern class to their first Grand Rounds. Um, I think that before we get started, though, um, I want to thank everybody uh, and reflect on emergency medicine's role during this pandemic. I think that we have seen science move at a pace that is faster than the history of science. And we have seen uh, and lived through and been able to lead through what is likely one of the most important uh, events in the history of medicine. It's also very difficult to do this without mentioning that our country is going through remarkable troubles and that this represents a time for reflection and a time for reflection where we all have to recognize that we have intrinsic bias and that there is bias in medicine and science and in academia as well as uh, the rest of the country that we are seeing and living through. So with that, I am thrilled to introduce Emmy Betts, the Associate Professor of Emergency Medicine, who will introduce this panel and this morning's Grand Rounds. Emmy. Great, thank you, Rich. And thank you everyone for joining us this morning for our first virtual Department of Emergency Medicine Grand Rounds. Uh, I'm really pleased to be able to introduce our speakers and then to facilitate the discussion after their presentations. Um, so a few housekeeping notes first. Uh, your computers are all muted, but we do want to hear from you. So please put questions into the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. You can enter them at any time. We'll be watching um, and collecting them for discussion at the end uh, at following both presentations. So our first speaker is Dr. Brian Montague. He is an infectious disease specialist and associate professor of medicine. He serves as medical director for occupational health uh, for UC Denver, and he's also an infectious disease consultant to employee health uh, here at UC Health Anschutz. He's going to be speaking about COVID-19 diagnostics, including his work on a multi-site project for COVID-19 antibody screening for healthcare workers and first responders. After he's done, we're going to move from COVID-19 diagnostics to therapeutics. Uh, and our second speaker will be Dr. Edith Ginde, who really needs no introduction for this group. Uh, but he is professor and vice chair for research in our Department of Emergency Medicine. He's currently leading or co-leading multiple national and international NIH-funded clinical trials evaluating potential COVID-19 therapies. So thank you again uh, for coming. Please remember to enter your questions into the Q&A box. This is being recorded. Uh, and now I will turn it over to Dr. Montague. All right. Well, uh, thank you uh, everyone for giving me the opportunity to speak with you all. I'm gonna say a few words as she said with regards to serologic testing specifically for COVID-19. I have uh, one disclosure, which relates to the study that she mentioned. I'm uh, part of a project, which is an investigator-initiated study uh, funded by Regeneron, looking to screen health workers and first responders for antibodies against uh, SARS-CoV-2. Uh, that's being performed at a number of sites uh, around the community, um, um, paramedics, fire, police, uh, as well as a number of hospital systems in the area. I'm not actually discussing any specific Regeneron products as part of this presentation. So uh, the first big question is sort of why are we interested in serologic testing? There's clearly been a lot of uh, requests for it. There's been a lot of discussion about it. And there's several reasons why one might consider doing it. I think the one that's most uh, clearly a benefit and has the widest spread use is using serologic testing to assess for epidemiologic trends. Uh, we know that uh, not all people who are exposed to coronavirus will actually become sick. So if you look at case reports, um, you may miss those people who are asymptomatic. Uh, we also know that not everybody presents for care. And so if you do population-based screening with serologic testing, it has the potential to give you your best picture of how coronavirus is, um, SARS-CoV-2 is spreading in the community. The second uh, potential use of it, and this is starting, um, uh, recognizing that we have many people who may have had coronavirus infection who couldn't get tested because they didn't meet criteria at the time or couldn't get tested because they didn't have access to care. Uh, 
the antibody testing has the potential to be used as a confirmation of infection in retrospect, sort of our, our uh, convalescent uh, testing model that we've used for other infections. So four to six weeks after the illness, you do an antibody test, and by that point, if they're going to develop antibodies, they should have, and a positive test would indicate that they potentially uh, really did have a coronavirus infection. Uh, third reason would be uh, in considerations for convalescent plasma. Uh, we're taking plasma donations from people who've recovered from coronavirus and transfusing them to people who are acutely ill with the hope that those antibodies will be of some benefit, and we can think through what that means as we look at the uh, the rest of the data we're going to discuss. Uh, the ideal testing in that regard would show that both the person has developed antibodies and that they've developed the right kind of antibodies that will actually provide benefit. Currently, we're not doing that testing. We're just taking donations from people we know who are were infected with coronavirus. And the last one, and probably the most controversial one, is using this as an assessment of prior exposure to determine are they at risk for reinfection. And what everybody really wants is a COVID immunity passport. I have my antibody, I'm clear to go back to work, I can take care of uh, COVID patients and not have any worry. And unfortunately, the evidence is a, a little bit uh, murky with regards to that, which we'll talk about. So this slide's uh, taken from um, uh, Nature Review uh, Immunology, it was uh, published uh, just recently. And what it's, uh, depicting is two uh, potential um, uh, paths that the immune response can take with regards to coronavirus. The one that we want is the one on the right. So this is what they've termed a healthy immune response, and it includes developing effective antibodies that bind the virus, prevent uh, internalization of the virus into the cells, stop viral replication, and allow the body to clear up the infection. Uh, this is, should be associated with rapid recovery from illness and relatively minor symptoms. The, the image on the left is a picture of what we might call a dysfunctional immune response. You know, antibodies are produced, but they're not sufficient to bind the virus and keep it from internalizing into the cell. They don't shut off uh, new viral production. There's enough binding though that they do actually stimulate some inflammation and this inflammatory response is potentially contr a contributor to the overall uh, progressive illness that we see with severe respiratory failure and uh, all the complications that follow. Um, the key takeaway from this is that in both cases, antibodies are present. So when we think about testing for antibodies, giving vaccines to elicit antibodies, the real question is, are we eliciting antibodies that are effective and will actually promote resolution of the illness, or are we potentially giving antibodies that could enhance the level of inflammation in the illness, and that's what's called uh, antibody-dependent enhancement of infection, or ADE. If we look at the specific targets for coronavirus antibodies, uh, there are two that have been focused on. Uh, the first is uh, nucleocapsid material. So this is the material here in the center of the virus that um, um, is uh, the most abundant material present in coronaviruses. Uh, this material has been used for a lot of prior testing for other strains of coronavirus. With the initial assays that were rolled out, there were some specificity issues with uh, cross-reaction between antibodies um, uh, for SARS-CoV-2 and other coronavirus strains. We do now have antibody tests based on the nucleocapsid antigen that are highly specific for coronavirus. The second one is the spike protein, which is on the outside. And in particular, people are looking uh, for antibodies for the receptor binding domain, which is the specific site of binding to the uh, ACE2 receptor that facilitates uh, entry of the virus into the cell. There's a thought, though it hasn't been clinically confirmed yet, that antibodies that bind to the receptor binding domain on the ACE2 are on the virus preventing um, attachment to the ACE2 receptor may be more associated with protection against infection and or complications of disease. And there's increasing concern, though no yet confirmed reports of the potential for mutations in the spike protein, um, because this does happen with viruses over time. If we had significant mutations in the spike protein, and in particular that receptor binding domain, uh, 
that could potentially impact the virulence of the virus, but more importantly, protection that we would get either from uh, prior infection or vaccines or monoclonal antibodies, which are in development. There are two broad categories of uh, assays that are out there. Uh, most of what's been talked about are the ELISA assays, which you see on the left. And the chief advantage of these is that they can give a quantitative titer. So the greater the titer, potentially the, the stronger the antibody response. Uh, following the titer over time gives you the ability to potentially look at the durability of protection. So if the titers significantly wane, you um, that may be an indication that the person has lost their protection. These have to be done in specialized laboratories, uh, which limits somewhat the scalability of the test. Uh, and the assays that are currently up and running for this are achieving sensitivities of 99 to 100%. So there, uh, there are multiple very good uh, ELISA assays out there. The ones that are in development that people have heard less about are these lateral flow assays. They give you the more qualitative yes or no response. Uh, they're potentially important in that they could be used in point of care assays, so a rapid test that could be done in the emergency department or something similar. Uh, the challenge is that the current generations of this testing have been significantly less sensitive, so sensitivities on the order of 70 to 80 percent. So if you got a positive test from one of these lateral flow assays, that would be informative, but if it's negative, that isn't enough to rule out uh, current virus. This is a list of the uh, laboratory assays that had emergency use authorization as of June 6th. This list, I'm sure, changes uh, frequently. Um, the top three are the ones that are currently in use at UC Health. Uh, Abbott was the first one that they brought online, and then they subsequently added the Diasorin and Ortho assays. As of the beginning of the week, all of the tests were being used interchangeably, though they are looking at uh, developing some sort of an algorithm of when it's appropriate to use one test versus the other based on source of testing, type of testing, et cetera. Uh, so that might evolve in the next week or so. As we think about antibody testing, I think it's very important to keep in mind that uh, finding reactive antibodies, reactivity does not necessarily equal protection. Um, the, there are assays specifically looking for uh, what's termed neutralizing antibodies. And in general, the way that these assays work is that you get a layer of susceptible cells at a culture plate. You add to that both virus and sera, and then you look to see if antibodies in the sera bind the virus enough that it prevents lysis of the cells on the plate. And there's two broad ways that these assays can be done. Uh, live virus is the most... Uh, accurate and reliable, and uh, the challenge of that is that it has to be done in tight infection control uh, um, settings that are not necessarily possible in all laboratories. Uh, there are pseudotype viruses where they essentially start with a less pathogenic virus that can infect the cells in culture, and then they um, use genetic modification to add into that specific SARS-CoV-2 proteins, like the spike protein, and then look to see if the antibodies can bind it. Uh, there are no FDA approved assays at this time, so this is only being done in research settings. Uh, the Morrison and Beckham labs in uh, RC2 have high throughput assays online with the live virus that are being used for research, and there are also investigators on campus that are uh, developing the pseudotyped assays. Those pseudotyped assays have to be validated against the live virus assays for us to know that they're really um, giving us the information we want. So I want to say a few more words about this concern for um, antibody-dependent enhancement. Um, a lot of the data with regards to the trajectories of antibody responses comes from uh, relatively small studies from China from the uh, early part of the epidemic. And so uh, what you see here is an example of 37 patients from China that were divided. Um, 20 had severe illness, 17 non-severe illness. And in the top portion, what you're seeing is the trajectory for IgA, IgG, and IgM over time, uh, first with all patients and second with severe disease. And what you'll see is in their testing, the IgM response was fairly low. Uh, IgA and IgG uh, really started to uh, rise by two weeks, but peaked somewhere in the three to four weeks range and then started to taper down over time. 
The potentially concerning part is when you look at the bottom portion and uh, what they've done there is they've divided out people with severe illness from those with non-severe illness. And what, what you see is a much higher peak in antibody response in the people with very severe illness. Uh, so uh, the intuitive interpretation would be, oh, you have a lot of antibody, you're going to clear the, the virus faster and that should be good. But what we're seeing is exactly the opposite. If you have a very strong antibody response, this is happening in the sickest people. Uh, that could mean that you're having a very strong response with totally ineffective antibodies. So it's not doing anything, but the antibodies are being turned out. But it could also be consistent with this concern for the antibody-dependent enhancement where you have ineffective antibodies that um, are, um, are ramping up the inflammatory response to the virus. If we look at the time to antibody development as compared to PCR clearance, uh, again, in one of these uh, small studies, um, what we can see is that looking at the dark red lines, these are the individuals that had the uh, most severe illness. And there was a fairly substantial delay between antibody detection and PCR clearance uh, as long as two to three weeks. Uh, more typical was uh, antibody detection prior to PCR clearance um, with a gap of something on the order of several days. And in just three cases, they found the antibody was detectable first and the PCR cleared later. Of note in this study, uh, they were only able to demonstrate an antibody response in 11 out of the 21. So 10 per their testing had no antibody response. Uh, and that was with weekly assessments over a seven week, uh, six to seven week period. The timing of the assessments vary, but was approximately weekly over that period. If we look at our initial testing experience at UCH, uh, people may have seen an email that I think came out over the weekend that uh, cited 2.3% uh, uh, IgG positive amongst the health workers. Uh, that initial screening prioritized testing of high-risk groups was, but was overall more of a cross-section of health workers. When they, they separately reported the positivity rate in all screening or testing, which is 3.7%. Uh, the second one, I think we have to keep in mind, is not population-based screening. This is, um, may include some people who are screening based on the, the occupational risk, but also will include people where a provider actually thought this person may have had coronavirus and is ordering the antibody test to confirm that suspicion. So it's not surprising that that's higher than the rate in the health workers. Um, it doesn't necessarily indicate that there's a lower rate in health workers than in the general population. Um, but I think the key takeaway from both of these numbers is probably 96% or more of the population. We don't have evidence of exposure. They are potentially at risk or um, infection if exposed, and there's a real potential for uh, future peaks of uh, coronavirus in the months to come. This data was actually taken from Slicer Dicer this morning, and what it shows is people where we have in EPIC both PCR testing and antibody testing divided by testing for the spike protein versus the nucleocapsid. And on the left is the spike protein. And what you can see is we had 87 total people who met those criteria. Uh, of those, 85% had a positive uh, response to the uh, spike antibody test, 14.9% uh, uh, did not. For the nucleocapsid, we had 62 who were, um, had had that test and were PCR positive and 90% had detectable antibody versus uh, 9.7 who didn't. So these are better percentages than what was shown in that um, uh, China study where they only got antibodies of 50%. But importantly, it's not 100%. You know, I think um, there's still a potential for people not having real um, confirmed illness, but not demonstrating an antibody response based on the tests that we have available. The important piece that's missing here is the duration of time from the PCR positive test to the antibody. So some of these people could have been tested too early, though I suspect that that's probably a small portion of the sample. The other thing that we need to keep in mind as we think about this is that for viral infections in general, uh, there have been um, regular descriptions in the past of 
second episodes of illness when people are re-exposed to respiratory viruses. So that includes influenza, RSV, and human metanumavirus, as well as potentially others. Uh, in general, the thinking is that we get better protection for our lower airways so that the, when you're re-exposed, you don't get pneumonia from the virus, uh, but you may still get replication in the upper airways. You may still develop virus that could be potentially transmitted to other people. <clears throat> if we look uh, using uh, the initial SARS virus, SARS-CoV-1 as an example, this was a study they did with uh, ferret models and they looked at viral titers in ferrets that were initially exposed, had the SARS illness, and then they re-challenged them at day 30. And there's a, a couple of things that one could take away. You know. First is that you clearly have a peak in viral replication early on in the first week, which wanes. Um, and then when you look out to day 58, there's still viral shedding there may have been some sort of a boosting uh, of that viral shedding with the re-exposure. Though if you really take a close look across the top, you could equally make the argument that this is persistent viral shedding from the initial illness. And that's basically been the discussion in case reports and um, non-peer reviewed medical literature about what we've seen. There've been multiple reports from Korea from the sailors who are on the ship that was stationed off the coast of Guam of people who uh, were initially positive, confirmed by PCR, had PCR clearance, seemed to get better, and then after a period of recovery had recurrent PCR positivity. In some of those cases, the thought was that it was persistent viral shedding and that the person was still dealing with their first illness. In some of the reports out of Guam, there was actually a concern raised that they may have a second, uh, may have had a second influenza-like illness when they were positive again, which would raise more concern that there was really a re-exposure and a second infection. If we look at the uh, overall duration of the antibody response, again, uh, using as an analogy SARS-CoV-1, uh, you can see that the time to uh, onset of antibodies was similar, sort of in the 15 to 20 days here. Uh, IgG levels peaked a little bit later uh, in this study. But as far as 240 days out, they still had detectable IgG. So to the extent that the antibodies are helpful, uh, at least for the prior coronavirus, uh, the antibody response was fairly durable, at least over the course of a year. And what happens after that uh, is too soon to say. So what are the, the key messages that we need to take away from this? Uh, I think uh, first, uh, antibody development can be demonstrated in as little as one to two weeks. Antibody development clearly precedes PCR clearance. So having an antibody doesn't tell you that this person's recovered from their infection and is now safe, and its clinical usefulness in that regard is, is limited. Uh, there's a concern for this potential for antibody-dependent enhancement of disease. Uh, it was a slightly different pattern in those graphs with a slightly more difference with IgA than IgG, but it was really potentially true for both. And detection of antibodies could either be helpful or harmful, depending on um, what we find with regards to that. Equally, that has implications for vaccines that come out. That if we generate the wrong kind of antibody response, we may be triggering that antibody and enhancement of disease. We don't have enough information at this time to say which antibody profiles predict immunity. There is concern that viral replication could occur in the upper airway after repeat exposure, and that that may give a potential for transmission risk um, for people who've been ill, recovered, developed antibodies, but who are subsequently exposed. And for that reason, all infection prevention procedures, PPE, isolation, and quarantine, need to be followed even amongst those who have detectable antibodies until we have enough information to really understand better what that means. All right, so with that, I will stop and Great, thank you so much, Dr. Montague. Um, we'll uh, switch over in just a moment to Dr. Ginde. Just a reminder to the audience, please put questions into the Q&A box. I can't promise we'll have answers for all of them, like when swimming pools might open, but you can ask anything you want. The questions are private. Um, and uh, so next, Dr. Ginde is gonna um, switch focus a little bit to therapeutics, and then we'll have a discussion. Thanks. I think I would have figured this out by now. 
All right. Um, good morning, everyone. Thank you for uh, taking time to, uh, to join us. It's really exciting to be able to have this opportunity to talk for the next 15 or 20 minutes about uh, COVID therapeutics. As Dr. Zane said at the beginning, it's really a, a fascinating and rapidly changing environment, as many of you have been following um, in the literature and in the press. Um, and I finished these slides last night and they're already out of date and that's sort of par for the course. Um, quick financial disclosures and no conflict of interest to report. Um, federal funding um, as listed here. One thing to mention is an investigator initiated grant from AbbVie for a, a COVID trial that is using uh, their product, Lopinavir, uh, Ritonavir, um, but uh, will not mention that product uh, in this presentation. So the rationale really needs no introduction. Um, you know, we're over 7 million cases world, worldwide. We're nearly at 2 million US confirmed cases. You might squint hard and see a little plateau here, um, but I think we're all expecting that to, <laughs> to start to go back up again. And we're seeing reports in uh, uh, nearly half of the states of increasing cases again, perhaps earlier than we were thinking. So um, this, uh, search for therapeutics is really important, um, and you know over 400,000 deaths worldwide, over 100,000 in the U.S. Um, we're still a ways off from a vaccine, even when a vaccine is available. It's not going to be perfect. Uh, this is incredibly uh, important and dynamic area to look for um, effective treatments. Um, going back to February, the WHO put out a research roadmap that I think really encapsulates um, the areas of focus. We are going to focus here primarily on candidate therapeutics, uh, but clearly interfaces with clinical management, clearly interfaces with vaccines. We just talked about serologic um, studies and antibody testing, really important uh, part of the epidemiologic work. But there is a big picture here. We're only um, tackling a, a small uh, part of the big picture, um, but we'll dive in. So thinking about uh, tailoring therapeutics to the disease. We know a little bit about the disease um, at this point, and um, I think as, as you've all observed clinically, um, there's kind of these the early phase um, and immunologically, uh, you know, that's associated with a, a response to the virus and, and the potential therapies in that realm really is around antiviral therapy. Um, patients tend to have mild symptoms. This is usually the first week of illness. Then either patients get better or they're the, the phase where they start to develop pulmonary symptoms, shortness of breath, hypoxemia. Um, that's often when we see the patients and need to admit the patients. Um, still antiviral therapy, but now we're starting to get a, a maladaptive host um, inflammatory response. Um, and so that's where in the therapeutic realm you're seeing um, sort of uh, immunomodulatory agents um, start to try and combat the host immune response or augment it in certain cases. And then for a proportion of those patients, unfortunately, they go on to, to critical illness. Um, this just gives a little more uh, detail. We're not gonna go through each of these pathways, but just to say that there's some, some elegant uh, mechanistic work um, about why we're targeting some of these agents. I think it's important to understand that they're not just being pulled out of a hat, even though sometimes they may feel that way. Um, but really, you know, targeting for the antiviral targets, different parts of the viral life cycle. So cell entry or endocytosis, transcription, translation, and then exiting the cell to go on to infect other cells. Those are all targets um, for therapy. And then for the immunomodulatory targets, you've heard about convalescent plasma and um, monoclonal antibodies, which are really, uh, showing some promise. And then there's just different aspects of targeting individual cytokines, targeting pathways. The JAK-STAT pathways uh, become quite commonly uh, uh, targeted with potential therapies. And then broad uh, agents, including anti-inflammatories like corticosteroids and immune stimulation like uh, interferon. What we've seen in that realm is a dramatic increase in the number of clinical trials. This is from website covidtrials.org, which really does a nice job of summarizing the activity that's out there. Uh, we're now up to 1,400 uh, registered uh, clinical trials in clinicaltrials.gov. Um, and uh, we're kind of around right here in, in, in early June. 
but just to think that really this started just a couple few months ago. Um, this blue line is when it's anticipated to complete. So very unusual to have trials that uh, think they're going to complete in a few months, and some of them are, and um, some of them are having difficulty. Um, but in this mix of 1,400 studies, there's many small single setter studies, many that don't start or don't complete. Um, there was a, a host, several hundred um, clinical trials in China that uh, started and then the pandemic went away um, and they were left with 20, 30, 50, maybe 100 patients in, in some of those studies, which was difficult to interpret. And I think as we'll talk about and really a focus of today, there's a tremendous variability in quality of these studies. And so something that just uh, being a savvy consumer of the, the literature is really important to think about. Um, as we saw on the last slide, there's many, many therapies uh, to consider in not very much time. The idea of this first wave of the pandemic was to learn as much as we can um, from this first wave, expecting that there's gonna be multiple waves or potentially another big wave um, and uh, just to do our best to be ready. Um, so the concept of a platform trial is not new. Um, and it's been used in the cancer world, especially for, for quite some time, but it's really caught, uh, caught fire within COVID trial research. And this is really the ability to test multiple interventions simultaneously and to get out of interventions quickly that do not seem to have promising signals. So this is really, the, the field has moved towards this approach where you have kind of one either placebo group or standard care arm, and you're kind of testing multiple interventions, you're getting in and out, um, hopefully one or more of these will be successful. Uh, but you'll hear that term uh, quite a bit of platform trial. So the, earl the early phase of clinical trials in COVID was really uh, these uh, small single center studies um, that were even publishing 20, 30 patients really hard to interpret, really confusing for the public and providers. Um, there's now a really well-coordinated global response to try and combat that. And these are multiple platform trials, as we talked about, through the WHO, through the Solidarity Study, the UK has the recovery trial, it's an international group called REMAP-CAP, um, and then uh, NIH um, launched the ACT uh, platform trial. Um, which is uh, which gave us uh, the remdesivir results, that, which we'll go over briefly. Um, but then there was still within NIH and within the U.S. a lot of one-off activity. NIH felt like coordination was still not quite where it needed to be, and different institutes at NIH were competing against each other. Um, so about a month and a half ago, Francis Collins, the director of NIH, launched um, an initiative to really bring together governmental agencies, NIH and non-NIH, um, as well as uh, partnering with industry around COVID uh, vaccine and, and treatment. And this is what it looks like. It's called ACTIVE, Accelerating COVID Therapeutics Interventions and Vaccines. And it's really a, a, a quite a remarkable uh, collaboration that uh, I think is, is quite unprecedented, bringing together industry leaders who are bringing products to the table, either products that are already uh, FDA approved for another indication, being repurposed, um, or, or novel molecules, with a bunch of governmental agencies. Um, and we've been a part of the NHLBI here and been able to participate in some of these discussions, which are really fascinating, um, as well as uh, program management through the NIH Foundation. Um, so I think that, that kind of sets the scene for the, the broader landscape. We're gonna talk, uh, briefly about a few kind of specifics on clinical trials, uh, but not go deep into results, really give a framework. Uh, just to mention, thinking about a primary endpoint in clinical trials is really important. Um, you'll see uh, uh, the term ordinal scales come out in a lot of these trials, and I just wanted to touch on it. Um, there's various versions of the ordinal scale, but essentially um, it is not just looking at mortality, it is looking at uh, stages of recovery um, as listed here. And the reason for this is, it gives more statistical power um, to, to get results. You can actually see a signal earlier. There's such a rush to try and get results that are meaningful, um, and it's still considered clinically meaningful. Um, so usually this is measured in inpatients at the two-week point, um, and this is uh, the scale that we're using in our ORCID trial. So I wanna to touch on kind of uh, release of, uh, of trial results by press release. Um, which has actually really become the norm and is quite troubling and challenging to deal with. 
Um, so this is the story of Remdesivir. Um, so on April 29th, the first press release that came out came from the company, who, Gilead Sciences, who is not supposed to know the results of the trial. <laughs> um, they're, you know, the trial's being conducted by NIH um, and sort of separate. And they put out this press release saying, hey, we have promising results. It looks like we hit our primary endpoint. Um, stocks went up. There was a huge buzz in the medical and scientific community. Um, but it was just really strange that uh, industry preempted the conduct of the trial. And even that uh, the next press release, which came a few hours later from NIH uh, through the, the NIAID Institute, um, uh, released a couple kind of top line results. Um, but still very unusual. This is not peer reviewed. This is just, you know, they just finished their analysis and now they're pushing this out to the scientific community. Uh, but that was enough to get an FDA um, EUA or emergency use authorization uh, for remdesivir uh, based on sort of unpublished results. Um, fortunately, uh, three weeks later, which has seemed like quite a long time, um, the preliminary report of the results came out in the New England Journal. Um, and uh, here was kind of the primary result. Uh, they actually uh, took that ordinal scale and for the primary endpoint, um, said who's recovered, which is essentially discharged from the hospital or only in the hospital for custodial care, uh, public health quarantine reasons. Um, and you know there was a four day difference, which is a meaningful, clinically meaningful result difference in median time to recovery. So 15 days in the placebo group versus 11 days uh, in the remdesivir group. I think it, it's not a home run sort of panacea, but you know, we certainly, uh, important and I think under scrutiny of peer review and the scientific community stood up and you know gives us something that it's in our arsenal. Um, I did want to touch on, um, since this is kind of the largest uh, placebo controlled uh, uh, blinded trial, over a thousand patients, I would pay particular attention to some of these um, subgroup analyses for heterogeneity of treatment effect and particularly um, thinking about um, issues like race and ethnicity, sex and age, um, you know, we know that there is differences in um, incidents and outcomes in these groups. Uh, we are very, very early in thinking about how treatment may interact with some of these groups. Um, you know, you can see if you squint hard, maybe there's a signal that, you know, white patients may benefit a little bit more than Black or Asian patients or even Hispanic patients. Clearly, the uh, confidence intervals overlap, and it's hard to, you know, the the data safety and data and safety monitoring board stopped this study because they thought it was not ethical to withhold remdesivir anymore. So, you know, this trial would have had more patients and may have been able to have more interpretable results. But I think trying to uh, uh, in subgroups, um, but I think just thinking about uh, this issue is really important. Here's what happened afterwards. So first, NIAID submitted that press release three weeks before publication. Um, you know, there, there's just a lot of politicking going on here. So this was uh, Anthony Fauci, the director of NIAID, criticizing Moderna for releasing early results of their vaccine study. Um, it's a very similar uh, paradigm, and I think just really challenging to think about how to deal with that. And then there, there's clearly a business side to these clinical trials, um, which is important to recognize, um, uh, even within a public-private partnership like Active. Um, so the thought is that there, uh, the financial analysis is Gilead will uh, get $7.7 .7 billion in annual sales just from stockpiling, not even from use. That's just from people wanting to buy it up. But there's another side of the business, which is it's actually not that easy to scale up. Um, so we heard two, a couple of days ago um, that re, uh, Gilead is going to run out of remdesivir by the end of June. Um, and it's unclear when there's going to be more, uh, more stock available. So that's the other side of it when you're thinking about, well, finally we have something that works and can we actually give it to people? Um, and there's a cost issue associated with that and a supply issue. I'm going to pause before we uh, finish with uh, uh, hydroxychloroquine. Um, just to say <laughs> that uh, there is uh, danger to epidemiologic studies too. And I use the word danger not lightly. Um, here was, this was the first time that I saw this. So this paper, which we'll look at, came out in JAMA. Um, you, got, you all may have seen this. That is, most patients, some reported nine out of 10 patients who put on a, a ventilator die uh, when they have COVID um, in New York City. 
Um, here was the study published in JAMA. So this is not a pre-release. This is actually peer reviewed. And here is the, the small part of table three that says 88.1% died who were on mechanical ventilation. This caused a huge backlash in patients and providers being scared to put people on ventilators, coupled with fear of environmental contamination from non-invasive ventilation and high flow nasal oxygen, which I think really did some harm because um, here's the actual result, um, which is that 72% uh, of the patients were still in the hospital. So this was just basically dying the, uh, uh, combining those that died with those that uh, were discharged. But this result was very incomplete and very misleading. Um, caused the editor-in-chief of JAMA, uh, Howard Bachner, to apologize, although they did not uh, <laughs> retract this. But I think just to be careful on that. And a good segue into um, hydroxychloroquine. And we'll finish with this. So uh, here is the, uh, I guess I can call it landmark study um, in uh, International Journal of Antimicrobial Agents. So this came out in mid-March. Um, was a convenient sample, was open label, was non-randomized, all the things that you um, don't necessarily look for in high quality evidence. And 26 patients received the drug, um, 16 non-contemporaneous controls at completely different hospitals. Um, that showed that the patients that received hydroxychloroquine and azithromycin had a faster time to clearance of the virus. Um, this is my only tweet, I promise, but I think really important, um, this is what led to uh, um, sort of this particular study led to the, the high enthusiasm from the executive branch um, about uh, these agents. However, um, and this is, you'll see this a common theme, uh, only a couple weeks later, uh, there were huge uh, uh, uproar about the scientific integrity, the ethical issues, the study started before IRB approval, um, the way that the data were handled. It's a little surprising they didn't retract the article, but essentially the journal said that um, it did not meet their standards, but we're going to keep it on the, our website. Um, but it has implications. Here's what happened. The public and private responses came, uh, uh, came out a few weeks ago in JAMA, um, which is prescriptions. These are outpatient prescriptions for hydroxychloroquine um, and chloroquine, which saw a huge spike. This is relative to the same period in 2019. Um, immediately after these results were released, then you know maps out the uh, press conferences, the um, EUA, the emergency use authorization. There's now shortages of drugs. People with rheumatologic diseases that truly rely on these medicines that are in trouble getting them. And then finally um, ended in the FDA saying that really these drugs should not be used outside of clinical trials, and there are potential um, harmful effects. But 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 these things matter. Um, and this is not even in the hospital setting. These are patients that are completely unmonitored in the outpatient setting. Then most recently, um, this is a, a, a paper from The Lancet, uh, almost 100,000 patients epidemiologic study, um, which basically said hydroxychloroquine and chloroquine were killing people. Um, uh, increase in mortality, increase in adverse events. Um, again, fairly dubious methods, but published in The Lancet, which is up there as a, the top tier of uh, clinical journals. Um, then uh, there, there was uh, um, uh, the press, which basically said, you know, this is causing distinct harm um, and often linked to what politicians are, are saying. And then of course, 10 days later, really, the retraction of the article by The Lancet and not as much of a splash about the retraction and the media, it's just not that interesting to the public, I think. Um, but you know, these things do harm as well. Most recently, this is only a few days ago, the recovery trial that we mentioned from the UK published a top line result, again, through press release with no peer review data that basically said there was no benefit in their open label, unblinded um, trial. It was randomized though, um, and it was a thousand patients. Um, it's just really dizzying. And I think uh, this is a really nice editorial in JAMA that came out a few weeks ago uh, from the editor-in-chief and the senior um, associate editor, just about managing expectations of these clinical trials and the recognition there's a lot of trials out there that have a different quality of evidence and will publish early um, in these ways. And so to think about that. And the press is picking up on it as well, um, that you know, there's uh, a need to really scrutinize this evidence. Um, 
This is interesting how the, the marked increase, I don't have the comparison data up here from 2019, but a huge increase in preprint releases. Fortunately, still a majority is in the peer reviewed literature, but I'd not even heard of med RX IV or chem RX IV until two or three months ago. And they've seen a dramatic spike. These are unpeer reviewed places where people are posting their uh, results and the media is picking up on it and going crazy. So, uh, and, and then if you compare the published paper, if it gets published to those releases, there's actually quite different uh, results. Um, and then just a recognition that we're rushing um, and we're making mistakes. Um, finally, just touching on the ORCID trial. This is the trial that we're doing at University of Colorado Hospital Denver Health and uh, 48 other uh, hospitals across the country. We did get the methods paper published a few days ago if you'd like to look at more details. But just when we launched the trial at the beginning of April, there were serious considerations of whether we were doing the right thing by withholding this clearly miracle drug from patients um, and a lot of pushback from providers and patients. Then we saw some of the results. Then we started getting comments like, aren't you hurting people? Aren't you killing people? I heard this, I heard that. Um, and then right now we're in the stage of, aren't we done with this already? I thought we already answered this question. There's not been one placebo controlled blinded <laughs> trial published on this topic. So in summary, um, this is an incredibly rapid, challenging, exhausting to do, exhausting to consume um, space to be in, but hopefully rewarding and hopefully ultimately will make a difference. There's a huge amount of pressure to produce un unrealistic timelines, and that goes for everyone. That goes for the scientific community, companies, medical journals have been caught up in this as well. There's this pressure to be first. Um, we've seen government officials, the media, and then providers as well, they're getting lots of questions from the patients trying to do the right thing, but having a lot of challenges. Um, my advice is don't overreact, especially when you see these preprint results, these media reports, um, be very wary. Um, read the primary papers and particularly pay attention to the design comparison groups, the population, make sure that it lines up. Um, um, all of this, I think, unfortunately, is creating a huge mistrust um, in science in general. That's COVID and non-COVID. Um, and what's going to happen is when we do actually find effective treatments or have an effective vaccine, I really fear that that's going to uh, decrease the uptake of these things, which are critically important. Uh, but I'm confident that we'll get through this together. And want to um, thank you for having me and for listening. There's a lot of people that uh, contribute to this. We have a lot of collaborations with critical care, hospital medicine, infectious diseases, and then a number of people, the research team, the regulatory and admin team, um, and most importantly, our research participants and the patients and families that we're trying to help. So thank you. Great, thank you both so much. You would be getting a standing ovation, I'm sure, in the if we were all uh, together. Um, so thank you for that. And we have about 10 minutes or so for some discussion. Um, just to point out for the residency, um, you do need to switch back to the other Zoom room at 10 o'clock to go to Journal Club, um, but we'll stay here and have a nice conversation, hopefully. Um, so we have some questions in the Q&A box. Please feel free to put additional ones in. I am gonna take facilitator privilege and I have one uh, question to start off, uh, really for Dr. Montepi, although uh, Dr. Ginde, if you'd like to comment as well. Um, I think we all heard a lot about and really felt at the beginning of the pandemic here that, that um, there wasn't enough, the testing got off to a slow start, but um, there, wasn't, there weren't enough tests or the test hadn't been developed or there weren't the testing supplies. I'm curious if you can just comment a little bit on what the balance was. Was it that we needed, that we didn't have the test or that we didn't have the supplies to do the test? Um, and specifically how that relates to what things look like for the rest of the summer in the second wave. Are we gonna be in a better shape, do you think, um, for the next round of testing? Yeah, it's sort of evolved over the initial period. Uh, I think the at the very beginning, all the testing was going through the state because there was no testing online at the university and uh, the private labs that were doing it, like Arup, had capacity for 100 tests or 200 tests, you know, and and so the um, they wanted to make sure that people who critically needed testing would get it, and that we weren't testing all the people who were worried but clinically fine. Um, when we actually started getting more testing up online, there was still a little bit of a lag that related to other test-related supplies. There were concerns about shortages of the 
of the swabs used for testing for PPE, and they had to come up with pathways where you weren't doing a separate change of PPE for every person you test, that you could actually go to a test center and the person wearing the same PPE could go through and test a whole bunch of people in the sequence. Uh, I think by early April, the hospital had several different assays online, so they could test through multiple platforms. And uh, by shortly thereafter, the feedback I was hearing was, we're not even testing to the capacity that we have. <laughs> you know that we could be doing more tests in a day and we're not. And what we've seen since then is that the permission to test has just gotten looser and looser. And now uh, the last statement I heard was anybody can be tested for any reason at the discretion of the ordering provider. So I think that will probably stay the norm unless we get some new supply shortage. But I, I think we're uh, probably at a point where the testing is sustainable. Uh, PP is still kind of a moving target, but uh, uh, I think we're better in that regard. Um, well, great. That actually leads nicely into a, another question that was in the um, chat box. Um, uh, really, I think around PPE and quarantine, quarantine measures. So does persistent uh, shedding data impact our infection control strategies within our clinical spaces? So for example, if a person is positive, do we, should we be treating them as positive for longer than 14 days? Um, you know, whether they're in the hospital or if they're going home. Um, so how do we think about when we can actually stop infection control measures for someone who's positive? There's a little variability hospital to hospital with regards to it. So for people who cover multiple hospitals, you have to check with the local infection control. What we have seen, you know, um, the CDC has two strategies for when you clear people. One is test-based and the other is sort of non-test-based. Uh, UC Health is focused on a non-test-based strategy, which initially was um, three days afebrile and at least seven days from the onset of illness. As some of the data regarding prolonged shedding came out, um, the CDC and CDPHEs um, um, now say 10 days post, which I think is reflecting this appreciation that some people have more prolonged shedding. The, you'll see mentions in the literature not well substantiated by studies that, oh, well, some of this ongoing shedding is just non-viable virus. Uh, but they never actually say, oh, well, we've done this study and we've shown that you have negative viral cultures at points A, B, and C. Uh, there are certainly studies that are out there that show at least small numbers of people with prolonged shedding who can have viable virus recovered from urine, stool, and other secretions weeks afterwards. Uh, so I think it's, um, you know, there's two qualifications to it. In addition to the those dates that I mentioned. The other statement is that your symptoms have to have resolved. So if somebody's had a prolonged illness and they're still coughing four weeks later, they're actually still going to be isolated based on the, pers the continuance of their symptoms rather than um, uh, a test-based strategy. So at the end of the day, it's evolving. It's evolving slowly. There's not great data to tell us what to do. And the people who are setting the policies are trying to weigh really what's feasible uh, against, you know, sort of the likely infection control risks and our overall airing on the side of being somewhat conservative. So. Great, thanks. I, I won't ask you about when the pools can open. <laughs> so, um, uh, Dr. Gidney, maybe I'll turn this one over to you. Um, uh, there's a question about an article that people with type A blood um, tend to get more severe disease, wondering if you could comment is that real? Do we know if, if blood type has anything to do with either severity of disease or perhaps antibody responses? Yeah, thanks. And Brian, I think might uh, have a comment on this as well. But, uh, but I, you know, that's a recent epidemiologic study, and it was really related to either type A blood having more severe disease or type O blood having less severe disease. It's, it's clearly epidemiologic. There's, there's certain data, even in non-COVID, um, you know, for trauma patients, for example, that uh, these various blood types actually following a similar pattern are associated with um, differential outcomes. Um, there's some mechanistic information uh, out there that would try to explain it, um, but I, I don't know that it uh, would be considered proven. It'd be really hard to, to think about how to prove that definitively and what you actually do with that information. So, but it, it's an in interesting epidemiologic phenomenon. Great, and I'll turn it over to you, uh, 
uh, Dr. Montague, if you have comments on that. And also there's a question around whether viral load um, correlates with antibody production. So if you get a, uh, a bigger, if people who are critically ill who have a bigger viral burden, do they have a more robust antibody response or not? Um, or by blood type. <laughs> yes. So the, the blood type information I think is too soon. There's not enough information to really make any useful comments about it. I think the, and uh, probably before we get to any actual mechanisms or how it might make a difference, the epidemic's going to pass. And so it's um, probably will end up just being a curiosity, uh, is my guess. All of the data that's looking at that antibody dependent enhancement of disease is essentially a correlation between uh, viral load and antibody production. So the people who have the most severe illness tend to be the people who have persistent high levels of uh, virus in the tissues who shed virus for long periods of time and they tend to have higher antibody levels. You know, so the, uh, the fundamental question is, well, what does that mean? You know, does that mean that um, the body's appropriately reacting and reacting strongly to a lot of virus? Or does that mean that the body's reacting strongly to a lot of virus, but it's a really ineffective response and that's why three days from now, seven days from now, you still have a lot of virus and that you're not clearing the infection. Uh, I think the worry is that it's more the second one, that it's not a robust, effective immune response that we're seeing, but what you're seeing is a lot of virus turned out because the response that you're having is not controlling the infection. So related to that, Dr. Kinde, there's a question from one of our residents, which is a great one as we're ramping up with the new interns as well. What do we do about NSAIDs? And what's the current thought on whether we should be avoiding them, using them, yeah. whatever people want. <laughs> great, great question. Uh, there was a huge concern at the beginning of the pandemic about a lot of things and NSAIDs were one of them. And I think as uh, more uh, epidemiologic data came out, um, essentially debunked the concern um, that it would increase risk of viral transmission or severity of illness. So I would uh, advise to uh, use NSAIDs as you normally would and help people feel better. Great. And uh, last question, um, really looking forward to the future. Uh, the question is how, whether we can look to experience in the Southern Hemisphere for prediction of a fall wave um, here in the Northern Hemisphere. And I'll, I'll make it a little broader too, if you want to leave us with any predictions about what the rest of the summer and the fall are going to look like, we would love to hear them. Do you want to start, Brian? Sure. Uh, I think the CDPHE's current prediction is for a new peak in August, which is really unfortunately timed as everyone's hoping their children will go to school. Um, the the seasonable, seasonal variability of coronavirus is less than some other viruses. So there, you know, there was political speculation that it was all going to evaporate by May. I think what we're really seeing is just continued transmission with periodic spikes based on, on the level of activity in the community and uh, community practices related to social distancing and so forth. So it'll probably be less a matter of the month and more a matter of what do we do with regards to our prevention strategies between now and then. And I would say, you know, it's very difficult to predict this. There's many prediction models that um, agree and disagree. Um, I do think that the evidence is really pointing towards a late summer mini peak. Um, and then I agree, coronaviruses are not as seasonal as say influenza, but do have some um, component of seasonality. And so from the clinical trials perspective and talking you know, with NIH and CDC and DOD uh, leaders, there's a full expectation of a larger wave uh, in the late fall, winter, hopefully not. And hopefully you know, effective social distancing will help. I think the vaccines will not be ready quite yet. Um, but I think until we get to that herd immunity, we're going to continue to see transmission. And the, the concern is we're only at three to five percent antibody um, response if those are even effective or neutralizing antibodies. Um, so uh, I think that's really challenging when the vaccine comes out. Hopefully the public won't have completely abandoned science, um, which I wouldn't blame some people if they did, given the current state, as we talked about uh, sure. But I think, I think we need an effective vaccine that uh, a lot of people get um, before, we're, before we're out of the woods. Yeah, well, wonderful. Um, I wanna thank both of you. There's actually a comment that this should be a recurring Q&A 
session for faculty and residents. So uh, Dr. Montague, maybe we'll have you back. You can't get enough of the ER. Um, thank you all. I think some of the take homes, remember to wear your mask, wear your PPE, wash your hands, um, be an advocate for, for truth and careful science. Uh, and thank you again, reminder to the residents and faculty who are joining Journal Club, you need to switch to the other room. And thank you both again to our panelists. Thank you. Thank you.